and welcome to another booktube video from me Lauren from Lauren and the Books. I hope you're all doing very very well. We're over halfway through the year. It's a bit of a late appearance of this video for me. Normally I've got it up bang at the beginning of June. Um, but this is my best books of the year so far. So um, the best books that I've read this year, the first six months of the year. Um, and yeah, I love to do these videos um, because it's nice to have a sort of check in with yourself and see what you've uh, what you've read. And I always say this at the beginning of every one of these best books of the year so far videos. When I go to film my best books of the year, it's nice to revisit this video. Hi Lauren in December, Merry Christmas, um, and uh, see what's made it and what hasn't made it, etc, etc. So I've got 10 books here, um, all very different types of books, and these are the top 10 books that I have read this year. Now I have put them in sort of descending order, so these are my top 10 books, but the, the one I mentioned last will be my favourite book of the year. So we'll start with number 10, which is Daughter of the Forest by Juliette Marillier. I read this on my e-reader, I got it out from uh, the library on the Libby app. I read it in March. I believe I read it as part of the Irish Readathon. Yes, that is why I read it. Um, and this is not normally my type of book at all. This is an epic fantasy, and I mean an epic fantasy. As I said, I got it out on uh, the Libby app, but it is adhesive. I've seen it. Um, and it's the first of the series following a young girl, Sorcha, um, and uh, her journey and... Um, life trying to break a curse that has been put on her six brothers that has turned them into swans. Um, what I really loved about this, and like I said I'm not an epic fantasy reader, but every single little detail like went towards a bigger picture so although you'd be reading about something that was happening in one one chapter later on it would allude to that later and it just built such a beautiful sort of detailed world um and i loved sorcha i thought she was great i loved the sort of like love stories in here felt like they i really believed them i really liked all the characters and it just was just painted beautifully in my head it was just sort of like crap i could just feel it all unraveling and I had a really good idea of what Sorcha would look like and what this lake would look like and what this castle would look like and and etc etc I just had a lovely time of it and I'm so delighted that it's the first in the series and I've got much more to get to I think I'm going to go to the second one on audio um I saw that the audio book is like over 20 and I think it might be 23 hours long so yeah it's just nice to be invested in something really big and fun so yes that was the first uh number 10 uh number nine this is a proof copy of Stronger by Purna Bell. I read this in January. Um, this actually came out this year on the 29th of April. Uh, this is a non-fiction book about Purna's um, life following the uh, the death of her husband who committed suicide. Um, this is about strength in terms of physical strength, mental strength, and it just explores so many different avenues of women's fitness and women's health. And Purna herself, who you, again, that word, journey, who you go on the journey with as she sort of comes to, I mean, when would you ever come to terms with the death of your husband? But like, as her strength increases following the death of her husband and she gets into weightlifting and things like that. I read and really enjoyed Eat, Sweat, Play by Anna Kessel a few years ago. And I feel like this is its sort of like stronger, older sister, <laughs> if you get if you get my drift. So I think if you like nonfiction about exercise and you, you enjoyed Eat, Sweat, Play, then this you would definitely, definitely like. But yeah, it's amazing. I follow Paula on um, Instagram now and I love seeing all of her posts from her sort of weightlifting posts to she's writing a new book which is very exciting um and yeah the writing was just fantastic and I really 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 got on board with it so I very much enjoyed it and it's always nice when a book that you read a long time ago so January in this instance has stayed with you and every time I see this little spine on my favorite shelf I think yeah um but yeah i was punching the air throughout quite a lot of this because it's just it's just it's got so much diversity in there in terms of representation of who is taking part in these different sports and um and different kinds of strengths and stuff so really really enjoyed that worthy place on my best book so far next up a poetry book well one poem in particular and that's the hill we climb by amanda gorman so i think every so often there's a book that um or, or or some sort of literary piece that really means something to that year and i think this is that for this year for me so 
this Amanda Gorman is a poet and this poem The Hill We Climb was read at Joe Biden's inauguration um, and I remember sitting here and watching it on the telly and hearing her speak her words and thinking what an amazing um, sort of uh, well an amazing poet and uh, performer she was and then got an email saying would you like a copy of this with a foreword by Oprah so read and enjoyed that as well and then as soon as I finished reading it I went online and watched the, the performance again and yeah I just it's just really stayed with me throughout the whole year and in particular the last line where she says for there is always light if only we're brave enough to see it if only we're brave enough to be it and that line has sort of stuck with me this whole year since I've heard that um, I've actually lent this book so I've got this book um, and I've lent it to my mum because she was quite into the poem as well so um, yeah I just think it's sort of like a, a what do you call it when something's like a benchmark do I mean a benchmark or just like it very expressive of something that's happened this year and I think if I'd have read it any other year I probably wouldn't have got quite as much from it so very much enjoyed that um, and gave it five stars the next book is actually the book I read before um, the, the the book before I read The Hill We Climb and that's Natives by Akala so I read both of these books in April and gave them both five stars um, Natives by Akala this was the first book of Akala or the first even like I'd heard of Akala who is a um, activist uh, uh, performer, teacher, lecturer, um, poet, journalist, just just everything you can think of that's to do with words, Akala has that sort of under his belt. And this is, as I said, a non-fiction book about race. And I'd been really searching for a book about race that sort of brought as much UK race um, issues to the forefront as why I'm no longer talking to white people about race um, by Rene Ojo Lodge, which I read um, a few years ago and revisited revisited this year actually no it was last year I revisited it um and yeah so I've been looking for something that that meant as much and was as informative as that and was delighted to read this and when I was reading it I remember saying that it was the best um first chapter of any non-fiction book that I've ever read and I really stand by that Akala's writing like I said is he knows what he's doing with the words and the, when they come across on the page they're amazing. A lot of people said to me that the actual the audiobook of this is fantastic as well. This touched on so many issues of race um, in relation to things like sports, theatre, um, entertainment industry, like with, without before we'd even looked at race and politics, which I just thought was a really, really clever way to look at it. Um, and with really up-to-date and relevant... Um, case studies that really got me talking with David actually one, one the one in particular was about um John Terry who was the was he the England captain at this point David yes he and was. he'd 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 said a racial slur to, to a teammate um and then was um was still allowed to go ahead and compete in the the, the um the competition and if anything there was like bit of antagonism towards the fact that maybe he wouldn't be competing in this after he'd said a racial slur in the workplace basically so yeah a lot of stuff that got me talking um and i really 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 enjoyed this and i would really highly recommend it um like i said one of the best opening chapters to a non-fiction book i've ever read wonderful so the next three books are actually books that appeared on the women's prize for fiction long list uh, this year and the reason i read them is because they were on the women's prize for fiction long list i always make a, a big effort to read a lot of the books that are on that long list it's a prize that i probably the only prize that i sort of get excited about the long list of the short list and the winner um and yeah so these books were read it's always exciting isn't it when you read books and love them that are on a on a uh, literary prize long list because you know you love them as much as those judges did so yeah they picked right. <laughs> the first one is um, Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. This has got a sort of extra special space in the old um, heart because we, we discussed this for my Patreon book club, which is a book club that I run monthly. Um, and uh, yeah, we had such a good discussion about this. We always have great discussion, but after this one, we were like, oh, God, that was such a good discussion and we all got so much more from the discussion we'd already like I mean I can't speak for all of us but this rated very highly in the book club um, and we all got a lot from the book anyway and then to sort of like pick it pick it apart makes it sound negative I don't mean it in a negative way but just to sort of disseminate it and just have a lovely time talking about it oh it was wonderful um this book is about um a couple a couple of um trans women reese and amy um amy has actually now detransitioned and is living life as ames um and has started a relationship with uh, his boss 
Katrina. Katrina falls pregnant um, and um, Ames asks Reese, his ex-girlfriend, if she would like to be involved in the bringing up of their child. So there's so much in here. So just when you think it's sort of about family and it's about a traditional family unit, you find out that actually it's much more about sort of kindness and compassion and um, making allowances for people and things like that. I learned a lot about um, trans people in this book and actually on reading it realised that I'd never read or seen anything, TV, film, anything about somebody who detransitioned so that was very interesting to me as well. Um, what I really enjoyed about this as well is that the three main characters, Reese, Ames and Katrina, I found them all quite prickly to begin with and didn't particularly get on with them but uh, by the end and particularly after the discussion we'd had I was very endeared to all of them and can see where every, every single one of their characters, I just felt like they were really really well written and fleshed out characters. So yeah, really really would recommend. Disappointed that this didn't make the shortlist actually because I really hoped that it would um, and yeah I think uh, I think it's a shame it didn't but yeah that was uh, the next book my next favorite book of the year um, then I've got Unsettled Ground by Claire Fuller this did make the shortlist um, this was the only one that I hadn't read by the time the shortlist was announced so it was exciting to read this and I bloody loved it I didn't realize what well, going into this that I'd read other books by Claire Fuller either um, so afterwards I looked at the um, Call it the old bibliography? I can't remember, but was surprised to see that I'd read other books by Claire Fuller. So this follows um, a set of twi twins, Jeanette and Julian, who are living in rural poverty uh, with their elderly mother. Um, Jeanette um, has suffered with um, a heart condition her whole life. She didn't get to go to school very much. Um, and they, uh, she, as a result of that, she cannot read or write. Um, Julian suffers very badly with travel sickness and is sort of tied to his life in terms of he can only go as far as a bike will take him. So all of his jobs involve um, like only being able to bike somewhere like as far as you can make it there and back in a day. And um, yeah, sorry, I should also say that these twins are in their 50s. So that was a nice sort of perspective to hear from in terms of of a protagonist of a book like I don't feel like you often hear from protagonists in their 50s um early on in the book Dot their mother dies and um a slow unraveling comes to um cut like you you, you slowly find out with Jeanette and Julian uh, with Jeanette and Julian that their lives potentially weren't as they thought they were and they learn stuff about Dot and about their past and things like that I thought it was beautiful and so I remember writing this word down sort of the writing was so luxurious like I remember sort of being reading it and just being involved in it and being sort of like all cushioned I felt like I was just there was only me in this book when I was reading it and yeah as soon as I finished it I wanted to start it again I really thought it was wonderful and yeah I thought it sort of gripped you in the right places and then fed you along in the other places and a really good um representation of rural poverty which I think is um something that you don't often read about I think Whenever, for when, when, whenever I've read about poverty, both fiction and non-fiction, it's normally urban poverty. So to to read about this rural poverty and and just trying to get by and things like that, it was um, very interesting. So yeah, would highly, highly recommend highly recommend um, and then the last of the women's prize for fiction I haven't got it here because I read it on my um, on the e-reader I got it out from Libby but I've actually bought it for my sister since then for her birthday and that's Piranesi by um, Susanna Clark. like where to even begin with this this is sort of like unbelievable unrelatable unlike anything I've ever read before and I was so endeared to Piranesi and the whole book it's very very visceral reading it opens with um, a a, uh, a, a scene where um, Piranesi is looking at a, um, a statue and that statue um, is a statue of a woman who has a bee crawling across her eye and it just like straight away I was in I was in with it and the whole thing is just very very bizarre you're, you're following Piranesi um, who is a character um, <clears throat> sort of ambiguous in age and sex and things like that um, and is living in these massive halls and is documenting everything that he comes to find and he calls them all very strange things like they're, 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 they're absolutely ca like these halls are massive because he calls it like the 53rd western hall where the seagulls 
oh, come and things like that. And twice a week, he meets up with somebody else um, and talks about what what um, what they found. Um, and yeah, I don't really want to go into more detail other than that because there's so much more to it. There's so many more layers to this. But yeah, I just found it phenomenal, really astounding. And like I said, unlike anything I've ever read before. Um, and Piranesi themselves. I was just so endeared to the to, to them. I just loved them. So yeah, really, really, really enjoyed that book. All three books that I that I read from the Women's Prize lo um, long list have just been fantastic. So yeah, any of those three, perfect. So the top three, um, in at number three is Rainbow Milk by Paul Mendes. Um, this is a great, great book um, told about um, a, a young chap called Jesse, who is a Jehovah's Witness. He's quite sort of established in the Jehovah's Witness world. He is um, considered a brother, um, and but is asked to leave the the uh, the fellowship. Dis, dis fellow? Dis fellowed I think he's called um, because of some homosexual advances he's made on somebody else um, in the in the fellowship um, at this point I don't even think Jesse realizes that he is gay um, but he leaves um, he leaves where he lives and moves to London and starts work as a sex worker now I really really loved Jesse I found Jesse really really funny I found um, his sort of observations on the world very very humorous and um, I just I was just I just really liked him I think we'd been mates <laughs> like it's what I'm saying I just feel like we got we'd get on very well um and there was points in this that are so touching and so filled with love at one point I let out a yelp because I was so pleased that something in here had come to to pass like something had actually happened as a ba as a basis of something that happened before um there's lots in here <laughs> and it's very very heavy in sex content like super super high levels of erotica but the writing similarly is so so beautiful and I'm reading a scene where Jesse is giving a blowjob to a man in Paddington Station when he first arrives in London and it is honestly one of the most beautiful things I've ever read so if you are able to turn an experience like that into beauty then oh my god it's just absolutely worth every every page was beautiful um, and it's also sort of semi-autobiographical so it's semi based on Paul Mendes's life which I really really enjoyed but yeah I just can't wait to see what more uh, Paul Mendes has got coming out there's a quote on the back um, from uh, Bernardine Evaristo who's written here when did you last read a novel about a young black gay Jehovah's Witness man from Wolverhampton who flees his community to make his way in London as a prostitute when when did you last do that and lastly just before I move on to a book to, uh, my second uh, favourite book of the year the um the the dialect in here is just done fantastically as I've just read from that quote there Jesse is from um Wolverhampton and reading out his uh, speech is was just so transformative and was just done so so well like one of the best sort of what do you do when what is it called when you write it on the page and it just it just I could hear it in my head how fantastically done uh, the accents and everything were so yeah really 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 loved that uh, number two non-fiction it's a memoir it's hungry by Grace Dent Grace Dent is a um, restaurateur a, a restaurant crit food critic a TV presenter um, from um, the UK and uh, yeah I, I asked for this for Christmas I got it for Christmas off of David's mum and dad and this is a memoir told um, through food food mainly but also with other aspects of um grace's life in like when she moved to london to be uh, to work in television she didn't really know what she wanted to do she wanted to be a journalist do this do this do this and then her sort of coming into what life would be like as a restaurant critic and and things like that and all um stuff that she used to eat as a child so much sort of like food nostalgia in here which is something that i really really love reading about i get very very immersed in food nostalgia um but as well as all of that and honestly this book had me sort of like laughing out loud in places as well grace is another person i think i'd be really good mates with <laughs> as well as jesse from rainbow milk i just think me and grace would get on very well um as well as all of that and me laughing and really enjoying the food writing and stuff there is some of the most heart-wrenching and i was in absolute bits at the end of this like just literally crying my eyes out um discussion about uh, what it's like to be caring for a parent with dementia particularly what it's like to be caring for a parent with dementia when you haven't even got a dementia diagnosis so you know something's up and you suspect it's dementia and you're just 
desperate for a diagnosis so you can get the help that you require and that happened for Grace who was having to look after her father and um, yeah the, the, the last paragraph, uh, the last chapter of this is just so so sad, so sad because it's interspersed with memories she's got of her father and her father was a bit of a cad when he was younger and stuff like that so this sort of like you're having to, to look after someone after the life they've lived and and oh god it was just so so sad and so so well done so yeah I would love to read anything that Grace Dent writes um and uh I'm currently listening to a podcast of hers called Comfort Food, um, where she's oh Comfort Eating, where she's um, eating her favourite comfort foods with uh, with guests, which is wonderful. So, if you like this, you probably like that podcast as well. So, loved it. Another one I'll be listening to the audiobook of because Grace herself reads it and I think it'll be even more funny in places and even sadder in places. Um, the last book of the year, I don't think this is going to be my favourite book of the year, I don't think this is going to be a surprise to anybody because I've talked about this a number of times, I've mentioned it on Instagram a few times and that's Severance by Ling Ma. Um, this is a book about um, Candice and it's a book about the Chinese immigrant experience. Her parents came over from China while she stayed at home living with her par uh, grandparents, made a life in America and she joined them. It's about work and the sort of monotony of working in publishing and the intricate details of um like getting getting the, so for instance she works in the bible department and they need a specific type of paper for this bible specific type of leather to bind it and like the intricate details of that and like going into real depths and how something that you find really important in your job isn't necessarily important in the bigger picture but during those sort of nine to five hours it feels like the most important thing in the world and it's also about relationships and things like that but it's also, guys, a zombie novel <laughs> because um, there is a, uh, so this was written in 2018 as well. And the stuff that's in here about a pandemic is so real to what has been happening recently. So there's stuff in there about um, a, a fever called Shen fever, which originated in China. And it's a fever that sort of slows down uh, people's brains. They're called the fevered who get this um, until they're reduced to sort of just performing duties that they've got in their muscle memory. So for example, they go to a house to get supplies and there's a woman in there who um, is a stay at home mother and she's just spending her whole time getting plates out, wiping them down, putting them on the table, putting them back, da da da, and she just sends that. And these people are sort of, slow, these, the, the zombies, the fevered, are just doing these actions over and over again until gradually they're wasting away. They're not interested in eating, or it's, it's not that sort of zombie novel, but it, there's that in there as well. So like, there's the action of that, and there's the really interesting sort of heartfelt moments of hearing about the Chinese immigrant experience. And then there's, like I said, the monotony of the office experience. And it was just so well balanced and so well put together. Once I finished reading this, I kept thinking, I wonder what's happened to Candice. I wonder how she's got on with this. I wonder what's happening to that person. And although the book is about Candice, it's much more about the bigger picture. I thought this was fantastic. And like I said, I just haven't stopped thinking about it. I thought it was amazing. And I would highly, highly, highly recommend it. My favorite book of the year so far. So those are the best books of the year so far. My top 10 books. Let me know if you've read any of these books. Let me know what your top 10 books of the year were, or even just your favorite book of the year. And I'll see you all again soon for another booktube video. Goodbye.